Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight for the first reading of the semester in the Southwest Minnesota State University Visiting Writers Series. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Susan McLean, a good friend and colleague, who will read from her new book of poetry, The Whetstone Misses the Knife. Later we'll have a Q&A and then you may purchase Susan's book and have her sign it. McLean's second full-length poetry book, The Whetstone Misses the Knife, won the Donald Justice Poetry Prize this year and is published by Storyline Press. Her first book of poetry, The Best Disguise, won the Richard Wilbur Award in 2009. She also has a collection of translations of over 500 Latin poems by Marshall which will be published in December 2014 by the University of Wisconsin Press. McLean has taught English at SMSU since 1988. In 2004, she won a McKnight Artist Fellowship for Writers, and she has been a visiting artist four times at the American Academy at Rome. McLean's poetry is distinguished by her love of writing in traditional forms, such as sonnets and villanelles, by her precision, her wordplay, humor, and laser-sharp wit. Please give a warm welcome to a brilliant poet and teacher, SMSU's own Susan McLean. Thank you, Marianne, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I want to invite everybody, if you're interested, to come to my house for a reception after the poetry reading. It's at 615 West Marshall Street. To get to it, you would go down college toward the center of town, and right after the bridge, take a right on Marshall. Then you go past 6th Street, and it's the next to last house on the left before you get to 7th Street, 615 West Marshall. I'd like to dedicate tonight's reading to Phil Dacey, who taught here at Southwest for many years and who was the one who got me interested in writing poetry again after I had quit for 19 years after high school, and he helped me a lot. He is now recovering from chemotherapy for acute leukemia, so I want to send good wishes his way as well. I'm going to start with a villanelle which has repeating lines and is based on a physical therapist's advice about how to go up and down stairs with a sprained ankle. It's called Instructions for Climbing and Descending. Good foot goes to heaven, bad foot goes to hell. When every step torments and pain is chronic, you can't do as you did before you fell and sprained your ankle. As the tendons swell, don't make things even worse. Learn this mnemonic. Good foot goes to heaven, bad foot goes to hell. Take one step at a time. Do not rebel or grumble that restrictions are moronic. You can't do as you did. Before you fell, you bounded up the stairs like a gazelle. But now your gait is nearly catatonic. Good foot goes to heaven, bad foot goes to hell. You've always known it doesn't help to dwell on loss. You should let go, but how ironic, you can't. Do as you did before you fell, but try to play it safe while getting well. The best advice is simple, yet Miltonic. Good foot goes to heaven, bad foot goes to hell. You can't do as you did before, you fell. I'm someone who loves to cook, and that also means I love to eat. As a result, whether I like it or not, I am often having to diet. This is called illicit. I needed to take a vacation from cake so my diet would be more judicious, but my plan was cut short by a chocolate fudge tort, and the relapse was truly delicious. <laughs> Next, it was cheese, such as triple cream brie's and gruyere's that I vowed to avoid. But I fell in the snare of a ripe camembert. It was bliss. My resolve was destroyed. When the experts all said, to lose weight, give up bread, 
I thought that was a food I could shun. I succumbed to the spell of the beckoning smell of a freshly baked cinnamon bun. I have found self-denial is not such a trial and has unforeseen good effects. True relish is hidden in all things forbidden. Have I mentioned I'm giving up sex? <laughs> Recently, a man died who had been my next door neighbor when I was growing up. Tragically, all of his children had died before he did, but I didn't find out that his oldest daughter, who was my age, was dead until after he died. Her parents had kept it a secret, even from their closest friends. When asked how the daughter was, her mother would reply, the same. This poem is another villanelle and it's called cul-de-sac. The man who had a perfect lawn forced his three kids to toil outside till every dandelion was gone. His wife, gentle and put upon, dusted the trophies of his pride for tennis, not his perfect lawn. His son, advancing like a pawn to keep his father satisfied, chose when his girl and job were gone to hit a gun or bridge head on. The neighbors whispered suicide while walking past that perfect lawn. The youngest, timid and withdrawn, lived with her parents till she died of cancer. But the oldest, gone for decades, had skipped town one dawn. When she died too, her parents lied that she was fine. Their perfect lawn remains, but all the kids are gone. My next poem is in the form of a rondo. It's called My Evil Twin. My evil twin is full of feminine self-deprecation. Don't be taken in by her rapt nods and deference, which mask her sly satiric humor. While you bask in her respect, she'll turn away and grin. You think you won an argument? Her chin is cocked. She's packing nitroglycerin. Why can't she let the matter slide? Don't ask my evil twin. One minute, she's as sweet as saccharin. But then, like any snake, she sheds her skin. If you suspect that it's a hopeless task to tote coax this genie back into her flask, you're right, but don't be fooled. I've always been my evil twin. <laughs> Poets are often strange. In northern Italy, I visited the home of Gabriele Dunuzio, who had a coffin made for him to sleep in. Uh, Robert Bly made fun of people who write sonnets by saying, quote, the sonnet is the place where old professors go to die. This is a sonnet whose title, Sishora, means a pause in a line of poetry. Sishora. This is the box I've chosen, having slept in it for years. I didn't need much room, and it was made to measure. I accept its augury of closure. In this tomb, the relics of my obsessions lie interred, maybe forever. It's a double-blind experiment whose outcome is deferred. It's terminus as open as one's mind. Unheard melodies, as I have learned, grow sweeter in the silence. Who can say whether these husks that hold us can be burned, or whether we're the molds that melt away and leave them standing. You too, Robert Bly, free as you are, where will you go to die? Our celebrity culture seems to value fame above all else, but there are drawbacks to that. Fortunately, poets don't have to worry about becoming famous. This is called Ballad of Not Being Seen, which is an allusion to a famous skit by Monty Python. Ballad of Not Being Seen. 
I'm not a star of stage or screen whose name adorns a lit marquee. I've never graced a magazine or traded quips on chat TV. The paparazzi leave me be. The public know me as a non, cloaked in invisibility which no one values till it's gone. I don't aspire to meet the queen or to impress a maitre d', to own a yacht to make the scene or to be called a VIP. Just class me with the bourgeoisie. No one's master, no one's pawn, sole monarch of my privacy, which no one values till it's gone. The life that I pronounce serene would likely fill you with ennui, but there's a comfort in routine and calm is no catastrophe. No one asks my pedigree, my past exploits provoke a yawn, but I have time for reverie which no one values till it's gone. Contented with monogamy, I do not pine for Brad or Sean, living in quiet harmony which no one values till it's gone. Poets always have the option of writing persona poems in which they take the voice of someone or even something else. The next poem is a persona poem in the voice of a mirror. It's called The Mirror's Desolation. Once you adored me, I would bask in looks you saved for me alone, giving no hint, if any ask, of secrets only I have known. But now you find me hard to face. I care for you too much to lie, copying lines you would erase. You hurry past, head down, and I, sensing your pain to dignity, return your look of mute distress. Though you no longer care for me, I do not love you any less. This next poem is a villanelle that I wrote at a poetry workshop at the Westchester University Poetry Conference. Uh, we were assigned to list some topics that we thought would be good ideas for poems and some topics that we thought would be bad ideas for poems. And then we were ordered to write a poem with one of the bad ideas. I thought that there couldn't be a less promising subject for a villanelle than endometriosis. <laughs> the word itself is terribly hard to rhyme. But then I thought of a few rhymes for it, and I was off. <laughs> this is called expert opinion. My doctor thought I suffered from neurosis when I complained of a recurrent pain that I thought might be endometriosis. I never guessed that such self-diagnosis suggested the distress was in my brain. My doctor thought I suffered from neurosis, prescribing acupuncture and hypnosis and Elevil. I started to explain. My sister had had endometriosis with pain a lot like mine. He upped the doses of tranquilizers. Was I under strain? My doctor thought I suffered from neurosis. If I remained insistent, the prognosis was poor. A patient hardly could be sane to claim that she had endometriosis against her doctor's fixed belief. Psychosis was possible. Perhaps I used cocaine? My doctor thought I suffered from neurosis. A surgeon, though, found endometriosis. People often wonder why women don't go into math and science in greater numbers. Well, here's one reason. The title of this poem is an equation. X is not equal to Y. Mr. Desiriga, whose claim on the first day of 10th grade math that boys are smarter than girls became the roadmap for my present path. To prove his point, asked who knew who McAdam was. I did, in fact. What's the aggregate? I knew that too, as well as that his deck was stacked. Winning, I knew I'd also lost. Infinite possibility was mine no longer. 
I had crossed into a region closed to me where every step was blocked or mined. Nothing I did could change his scorn of me and all my lesser kind. Feminists are made, not born. I like to set myself challenges, and one of them is to take some old poetic forms that have been out of fashion for centuries and try to write them. So this is a rondelet, and the title of it is What Goes a Rondelet? You were the one who always told me what to do. You were the one who said I ought to buy a gun. So when you said that we were through, one of us had to go. I knew you were the one. <laughs> I was surprised to learn on a nature special that the big cats such as lions and tigers, which one tends to think of as being very deadly, actually have a very high mortality rate, which inspired this next poem about high school. High school pride Sleek in their strength and beauty, haughty, live, prowling alone or stalking in a pack. They cut down herds of victims like a scythe, then search for fresh meat, never looking back. Theirs is the world and all the grazers in it. They call the weak, the callow, the unwary. The pack itself can change at any minute, for all alliances are temporary. How fine to be the hunters, not the prey, to ambush, wound, or take down all they see, while we, their hapless quarry, would contrive to be as cruel and merciless as they if we could share in their ascendancy, not noticing how few of them survive. I spent one Valentine's Day in Minneapolis going to see the frozen Minnehaha Falls, which inspired this next poem, Minnehaha Falls. It takes a certain nerve to scrawl graffiti on a waterfall, defacing not the rocky shelf it falls from, but the falls itself. Where but in Minnesota will a rushing cataract stand still while slogans in blaze orange are sprayed across the spill of the cascade. A miracle of rare device, stalactites of blue shadowed ice emblazoned with an urgent screed we cannot overlook nor read. But time, as it unlocks the spray, will wash the vandal's words away, as surely as his epitaph when nature has the final laugh. Not too long ago, my mother had surgery to determine whether she had cancer. And this next poem is about that. It's called Jeopardy. The first thing she requests post-surgery, awake but drifting in the morphine glow, is that my sister turn on the TV so that the two can watch her favorite show. Weak but alive, Unsure if she has cancer, my mother turns to questions she can answer. Fortunately, it was not cancer. I don't know whether home economics is still taught in schools, but back when I was a teenager in junior high school, all girls were required to take it. This poem is called Home Economics. Like other teenage girls in 65, I learned to knit, embroider, and crochet. So if I'm teleported back in time a century or two, I'll do okay. I learned the way to wrap a package neatly, to tie a range of plain and frou-frou bows, to minimize by my body flaws discreetly using the cut and pattern of my clothes. I also learned to iron, hem, and baste, to sew on zippers, trim, and applique, to choose a hairdo that would suit my face, 
and nothing that I ever use today. <laughs> I was a fan of the show Star Trek, so my next poem is inspired by that. It's called Loving Mr. Spock. At 16, I was hooked on Mr. Spock, not knowing why his cool control disarmed me while Kirk's grand passions seemed a laughing stock. Each week, another loved and left. What charmed me, I think, was not Spock's coldness, but my guess that hidden urges gnawed at his resistance as mine gnawed me, his stoic loneliness a shield against the claws of loss and distance. I now know passion only lasts on ice. Nothing attracts like those who do not want us or do but can't be had. The paradise we own, we do not see. It cannot haunt us like that tall figure, silent and apart, still burning in the black hole of my heart. I liked Edgar Allan Poe's poetry a lot when I was young, but I was a little taken aback to learn later on that he thought the perfect theme for a poem was the death of a beautiful young woman. So in this next poem, I imagine a young woman being introduced to Edgar Allan Poe. It's called Morbid Interest. How unpleasant to meet Mr. Poe. It gives a young lady a chill when just as she's saying hello, he asks if she's lately been ill. <laughs> it was mid-afternoon, yet he seemed to be tipsy or mildly sedated. How oddly his mournful eyes gleamed when he heard that we might be related. <laughs> he muttered some rhymes for my name, saying nothing could be more inspiring to a poet desirous of fame than the sight of young beauties expiring. <laughs> then he asked if I had a bad cough or a semi-conversable crow. I informed him of where to get off. How unpleasant to meet Mr. Poe. <laughs> Some people here may have known Kathy Cowan, who was a professor of psychology here at Southwest, and who was also a good friend of mine. My next sonnet is called Survivor. My good friend Kathy struggled to resist Survivor, but confessed she was addicted to watching shallow schemers get evicted by worse ones. Maybe the psychologist in her liked seeing how the lure of cash exposed the gears of ego and deceit. Or maybe she was captured by the heat of loss like gawkers gathered at a crash. She died in such a crash. I didn't know it till later. I was on an island cruise with family when she skidded on the ice. Chance spins the wheel. It doesn't punish vice or give immunity for good. The show goes on. There's always someone else to lose. Asana Nizio is a form invented by the poet Kim Adonizio in which she takes one line from someone else's sonnet and then she takes one word from that line and repeats that word in each of the subsequent 13 lines of the sonnet. I tried writing one and I'll let you know that the repeated word is where so you can listen for it. This is Women's Wear Daily, Asana Nizio, and it comes from a line from Anne Drysdale's poem, The Self I Made You, and the line is, slip into something easier to wear. Women's Wear Daily, Asana Nizio. Slip into something easier to wear than underwear designed to pinch and squeeze. Recall red grooves from strapless bras you swear are quite unwearable. 
the agonies of welts and jabs from corsets, wear and tear from straps that chafe and thongs that dig, forswear footwear with breakneck tilt, stiletto heels. Remember, wearing fishnet stockings feels like walking on small BBs. <laughs> Be aware that low-cut tops and short skirts Show your wares to eat with each unwary bend and step upstairs. The cost of all that software is hard to bear. It suits his hardware now. Will he still care when years have passed and you're the worse for wear? I'm sure Robert Frost's famous poem, The Road Not Taken, has inspired a lot of other poems, but this is one of them. It's called The Only Feminist in High School. Two roads diverged in high school when a student chose to study women's liberation to write her senior paper. Though imprudent, that choice provided her an education in bias, inequality, derision, the second sex, the feminine mystique, historical erasure, long division, and talent gagged and shackled by She swore off makeup, wanted a career, but maybe not a family. She read Kate Millett, Gloria Steinem, Germaine Greer, and gave a speech on beauty, which she said turned women into objects and betrayed their goals. She didn't want to be a mom or movie star. When she went out, she paid, though never asked, she boycotted the prom. The boys were baffled and the girls disdainful, but who would want to talk to, much less date her? And what she lost was obvious and painful, while what she gained was only clear years later. My next poem was inspired by a competition to write a poem about a famous John. I think you may figure out which one I'm talking about before I reveal the name in the last stanza. Dear John, at first he seems the spineless sort, no firm goals, nothing much to do, a slacker, always falling short. Then suddenly he grows on you, and when he rises to the task, he always makes a big impression. He's up for anything you ask. Just don't ask twice in quick succession. At length, the effort he expends depletes him and his spirits droop. Making a comeback then depends on having downtime to recoup. John Thomas, you're the lad for me. Life's flat without you. I remain confident you'll come up and see me soon. Yours, truly, Lady Jane. John, John Thomas and Lady Jane play important parts in Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence. One is always told to avoid cliches in poetry, but every now and then you can take a cliche and repurpose it by giving it a whole new meaning. This poem is called Dead Giveaway. Who'll take my dead? I've carried them so long my mind is sway-backed from their aching weight. I can't just cast them off. It would be wrong to leave them in some shed like unclaimed freight. How could I walk away as Kathy's smile collapsed, as Brian gently said, take care, and Grammy begged, please take me home now, while I shut them in the dark and left them there? I've jettisoned so much I took to heart. The afterlife, belief in justice, prayer. I'll have to lay them down as well, I know. After a party when my friends depart, I wash up, stow away what's left. Yet they're still here. The dead are always last to go. My next poem is another ballade, and this one appeared in the European Journal of International Law 
no one could be more surprised than I that it was accepted there. Schadenfreude in the title is a German term that means gloating over the misfortunes of others. Ballad of Schadenfreude. He made a mint in properties before their worth began to slide, but now he's charged with felonies and tax fraud. Have you seen his bride? I'm sure those breasts aren't bona fide. No morals and no underwear. I never. I still have my pride. I pity that poor millionaire. Lie down with dogs, get up with fleas. Take it from me, her hair is dyed. I'll wager she has STDs and used to be the local ride. Too bad she has him roped and tied. She'll start a casual affair before the wedding ink has dried. I pity that poor millionaire. I hear she goes on spending sprees with girlfriends that he can't abide. She'll lace his food with antifreeze or drive the man to suicide. Her contacts keep her well supplied with cocaine when she's on a tear. She'll take him down like cyanide. I pity that poor millionaire. Princes of profit who have vied for trophy spouses have a care. Nobody wants to hear the snide. I pity that poor millionaire. A Kyriel is the name of a poem in which the last line of every stanza is the same. This Kyriel is called Inheritors. We've learned to live outside the light, to lurk in nooks and dodge a fray. We may look harmless, but we bite. The dinosaurs have had their day. What huge teeth, what a tiny brain, the heft and bulk that gave them sway grow ever harder to maintain. The dinosaurs have had their day. As they are sinking in the mire, from tuft to tuft, we pick our way. We have the nerve and the desire. The dinosaurs have had their day. Time favors us. We'll wait them out. We're small but fast. We mean to stay. Our greater numbers give us clout. The dinosaurs have had their day. Their blood is cold, but ours is warm. The clouds that make the sun turn gray are not just from a passing storm. The dinosaurs have had their day. The title poem of my collection was inspired by hearing that the poet Rachel Whetstone had committed suicide because of an unhappy love relationship. And it started me thinking about relationships that have a lot of friction but the last for quite a while because both parties are getting something out of it. So this is called The Whetstone Misses the Knife. I answered your desire to meet resistance and be honed by friction. Sharp as you were, you couldn't beat the zero sum of contradiction. Abrasion was your privilege, the only stroking I have known. Now you have lost your cutting edge and I am just another stone. Kirsten Dunst said about her role in Spider-Man, I just don't want to be the damsel in distress. I'll scream on a balcony, but give me something to do. This poem is called No Thanks. No one wants to be the damsel in distress the one in need of chivalry, chained to a rock in nothing but her skin. No, one wants to be the one who skirts the trap and steals the key, testing the rope bridge with a shaky grin. Whoever longs for victims he can free is not a hero but the villain's twin. So save yourself. Don't go expecting me to play the clingy wimp, the might have been no one wants to be. My next poem is the very first poem that I got published after my high school literary magazine. It's called Plain Geometry for Lovers. The shortest distance between two points of view is a straight lie. Two lovers laid parallel in bed will never meet. 
a man who touches you once is on a tangent. Secant, you may find. If he's oblique and you're acute, you'll know he has another angle on the side. <laughs> Congruity is the paradigm of love. One figure overlapping another, touching at all points. When Prince William and Kate Middleton got married, it reminded me of the previous wedding of Charles and Diana. This poem is called Royal Wedding. We wheel them out, the sacrificial pair, not in a tumbrel, but a gilded carriage to state the millions watching on the air. But it's no slaughter, just a royal marriage. They're stand-ins for our fantasies of glory, romance, and opulence. Their own small dreams dwarfed by the rigid scaffolding of story. There is encrusted with bejeweled seams. Later, when the telephoto lens captures each fleeting frown, rolled eye, and wince, will revel in their misery as pens dissect the festering home life of the prince. But what are monarchs for, if not to slake our thirst for watching crystal dream homes break? My next poem is also about love. It's a little tongue in cheek. It's called Rules for Love. Don't wear makeup, ever. Don't act girly. Don't collect shoes or shop until you drop. If your hair is straight, don't make it curly. Don't play dumb or play as games. Don't stop reading or saying what you think. Don't flatter. Don't claim that you love football if you don't. Don't sidestep. Don't pretend it doesn't matter if he puts down your friends or if he won't do his fair share of housework. Do your best to give your talents scope and free his own. Grill steaks, eat chocolate. This is not a test. If he won't love you, you'll do fine alone. Sex is a bonus. Give as good as you get, but make it clear you don't intend to marry. Love what you have and what you don't forget. These worked for me. Your own results may vary. <laughs> one can't avoid seeing a lot of wind farms if one drives around Minnesota, so this is about that. It's called Reaping the Wind. The giants swing their triple arms or poise frozen like hazmat signs on every hill. Alien prayer wheels of unending noise or monuments to birds and bats they kill. Shivas whose dance preserves us and destroys a landscape that no longer can stand still. Most people manage just fine without poetry most of the time. But when a really dramatic crisis happens to them, that's when they tend to find that poems can help them deal with it. This is called Teaching to the Test. I know you have no use for them, poems with their sly, quicksilver words that won't just speak their mind but carry them through your head like startled birds. Is that despair or longing in their cries? Their dollars make no sense. They'll never buy you larger screen TVs or seats at sports events. But someday, as you watch a pair hold hands and leap from a burning tower, as you wait for test results or hear your phone ring at an unaccustomed hour, what you feel will circle wordlessly, tense, accusing, gaunt. You'll find that you are tested and found wanting, and these are what you'll want. My last poem isn't in the latest collection. It's something that I wrote since then. 
The problem with families is that the different members of the family all have understandable reasons for wanting different things. So what most people associate with families is feelings of frustration. This is called family ways. A man who liked to have his way, and who does not, was keen to have the final say. His sister's tongues had lashed him raw, so in his home, his word was law. Dissension was a fatal flaw, or so he thought. A woman who desired a choice, and who does not, played dumb until she lost her voice. Going along with his caprice would quickly make the conflict cease. What mattered was to keep the peace, or so she thought. A child who wanted to be heard, and who does not, learned early on that mum's the word. With no recourse but to comply, her options were to sulk or lie. She had her fill of humble pie, and so she fought. Each of them fixed in their belief, and who is not, they danced their alamand of grief. Still passing blame, they each refuse. They cannot wear each other's shoes or change the steps, and so they lose the peace they sought. Thank you, everybody. And a reminder that you are all welcome to uh, come to my house, 615 West Marshall Street, for a reception after this meeting. Though, it'll take me a few minutes to get there because I'll be signing books afterwards. Meanwhile, does anybody have any questions? Yes? I was wondering how you come up with the titles of the poems. I often pick the titles first. The title is often the clue that gives me the poem. Uh, I see some kind of combination of things in the title. And if I get a title in it, a line or even a phrase, then I know I, I've often got a poem. Yes? Um, when dealing with uh, form, or form poetry, do you search for the form that you're going to do, or do you, do you have the material first and you try to find a form that fits it, or do you pick like, okay, today I'm going to pick a villain out and then try to find a subject? It can go either way. Sometimes I start with a form that I really want to write and I try to find something that will fit the form. More often though, I get an idea and I don't know what form it's going to be in. As I start writing it, it finds the form that it needs to be in. So that is the way I often do it. I'll write a line and then I'll decide, well, is this a sonnet line? Is this a villanelle line? Is this a line of something totally different? But I make it up as I go along. Sometimes it's, everything's up in the air. But I love form because form, in a way, is something to fight against. It's something that makes it harder. And I find that making it harder for myself actually produces a lot better results than just doing the easiest thing. So that's what I love about form. It makes it a lot harder. And I have to try over and over and over again for just the right word, but it's worth it. So that's why I do that. Anybody else? Yes? It's kind of refreshing to hear how feminism has influenced your poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about how it's influenced you as a teacher? Um, I don't think I'd be a teacher if I weren't a feminist. Basically, um, getting a PhD is a long, hard slog. You have to be totally committed to doing something like that. and. Um, if you take the path that society wants you to take as a woman, it never wants you to get a PhD and become a professor. So you have to fight every step of the way if you're going to accomplish anything except exactly what society tells you is the thing you ought to be accomplishing. And then how do you, how do you, use, how do you expose students to feminism in your classes? Um, I don't know. I, I I model it. I don't talk feminism all the time, though I do talk uh, gender in some classes, and um, I'm always consciously aware of it. I've taught a lot of uh, courses that are about female authors that hadn't been taught a lot um, before I got here. So those are very small ways in which it influences the way I teach. Yes? Most of the 
most of your audience probably noticed tonight that you recite your poetry by heart, mm -hmm. uh, very little reference to her lines. And I know you can do that with most of your poetry. Why, why do you choose uh, that delivery style? Mm. My poems are written to be heard. They aren't really written to be read. So I love performing the poems, but I can perform them a lot better if I know them. I also find that when I'm even writing the poem, I run it through my head over and over again. I write some of it in my head as I'm writing. So even if I'm lying in bed at night and it's dark, I can be working on a poem without turning the light on because I'm, I'm working on it in my head. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons that I memorize the poems, but partly I do it just because I love them. And uh, it's, getting, it's getting harder. When I used to know all of my poems by heart all of the time. These days I have to review because I've written so many, I can't just call them up at the drop of a hat. I have to have a little practice session first. Yeah, John? I stopped writing because uh, everybody was telling me that poems in rhyme and meter are totally unacceptable and that you can't write that way anymore. And I love that kind of poetry so much that I just decided I'd rather give up poetry than give up the kind of poetry I loved. So I gave it up for 19 years and then Phil Dacey uh, encouraged me to write whatever I felt like. I knew that he wrote in rhyme and meter himself, so I knew he wouldn't make fun of me for it. And by that time, I was a little more confident myself. I wasn't just a high school student who was easily cowed by professors telling her, you can't do that anymore. So there were a combination of reasons why I started again. Anybody else? Yes. Ruth. Okay, yeah, uh, feminism is the new F word. It is the one that nobody wants to say and certainly that nobody wants to claim, but it's meant a huge deal to me um, in giving me the okay to try to be everything I could be and not just what I was allowed to be. So that idea that you don't have to let other people tell you who you should be, you can find it for yourself. Feminism is something that allows everybody to develop to their full potential. That's just how I view it. And so that's why I am proud to be a feminist. I'm from a family of scientists. <laughs> my uh, father was a plasma physicist. My mother was a chemist. I have a sister who's a biochemist. I have a brother who's a neuroradiologist. Uh, science and math come naturally in my family, and yet I had this very discouraging experience very early on. I've got to say I've always been a word person, so I probably would have gone in the word direction even without that experience. But something like that can really turn you off. And so um, I will say that rhyme and meter involve counting. You actually count syllables and you count beats per line. And that precision is very um, pleasing to me. And so yeah, there is a mathematical quality to the poetry I write. Anybody else? Yes, John? Uh, poetry is a lot of things. It is a form of self-expression. It is an art. Uh, I don't have a good grasp of music, but for me, poetry is singing in words. And so I do it because I love to do it. And I've always enjoyed that kind of music of words from the time I was a little kid. So it was very hard to give it up 
and I, I never really uh, gave it up. I, I was still reading poetry even when I wasn't writing it. But it's therapeutic. You might find that I have mentioned a lot of autobiographical experiences in my poems. When something is bothering you, if you write about it, you get control over it. And so I find that that ability to take especially the unpleasant experiences and make them mine um, gives me a sense of power that I don't have any other way. Anyone else? Yes, Marion. Yes, well, in a way, fashion and poetry is like fashion in anything else. Things come, things go, and um, poetry and rhyme and meter was out of fashion when I was a teenager, and it was just bad timing on my part to be a teenager then and to love poetry, but there wasn't really anything I could do about that, and it took a long time to find anybody else who loved rhyme and meter, but the great thing about the internet is that no matter what weirdo interest you've got, there's somebody else out there that shares that interest. And you can connect online. And so there is an online poetry workshop called Eratosphere that I've been a member of since 2001. And it's all people who really love rhyme and meter and who critique one another's poetry and make suggestions to make it better. And Everybody there is committed to the idea that you can write a very modern, interesting poem in write and meet, rhyme and meter, and so that's what I try to do. Anyone else? What's, uh, what's been like the biggest challenge in your writing? Like, like, is it trying to sometimes be like, oh, I really want this word, but it doesn't fit with the syllable count? Well, it's frustrating when you can't get a poem to work, and sometimes I set it aside. I recently had a villanelle I was working on that just was not working, and I set it aside for several months. And then uh, recently, over fall break, I went back to it, and I figured out what was wrong with it, and I could fix it then. But sometimes you just can't do it at the time, so a little time can sometimes give you some insight into what you need to do with it. Um, I like, as I say, giving myself big challenges. I read two ballads tonight. Ballads are fiendishly difficult to write in English because they're very long poems that have just two rhymes, and English is not rich in a lot of words that rhyme with one another. So it's a French form. Almost everything rhymes in French. And so to be able to write a couple of ballads was a real sense of accomplishment. I would say um, I adore villanelles. I keep going back to them over and over again. But as I write more and more, I find that the sonnet fits more ideas than a villanelle. So I probably have written more sonnets than anything else because it's just the perfect length for exploring an idea. A villanelle is trickier, so it doesn't fit everything. Jerry. So these days, Mm -hmm. How do you, do you see those as forms, like a sonnet is a form? Do you see what they're doing mm -hmm. in, in the sense that it's, it's an additional form? Yeah, I, I got to say, it's a form too. Um, songs are written in uh, rhyme and meter too, and rap is just one kind of song that also is written in rhyme and meter. So it, there are many, many kinds of songs out there. Songs are a little different because they've got the music as well. I don't have music behind me, so I have to put all the music right into the words. But um, when you're writing a song, some of the music, some of the beat is carried by the song itself. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, I have. I, I think you can't be a poet or a writer at all without occasionally running into writer's block. And I discovered um, translation. 
I, does, I translated some poetry when I was an undergrad at Harvard. I um, took some Latin and enjoyed translating Latin poetry into English. And so when I'm blocked and I want to do something, I get out a Latin poem and I translate it into English and I can do that anytime. The ideas for poems don't come every day. And so I have a lot of time when I want to write, when I don't have the idea, this is something I can substitute that works all the time. Anything, anybody else? How do, you, how do you pick your subject matter? Uh, it kind of picks you, you know? Everybody's got obsessions. And when you're a poet, you go back to your obsessions over and over again. So, you know, I have a lot of different obsessions, but a lot of these poems have, um, oh, repetitions of sorts of the subject matter as well as the form. No, I, I don't, I don't, but I've got to say that uh, one of the things that is often a trigger for writing poetry is taking a shower. Um, I, I find that in the time it takes me to dry my hair, which is about a half an hour, <laughs> I, I can sit there with a pad of paper and a, a pencil and uh, start a poem. So I get the ideas while I'm showering and then I write them down while I'm drying my hair. But I don't have to do that to write a poem. I can write a poem anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of them mean a lot to me in very different ways. Um, I'm very fond of that plain geometry for lovers just because it was the first poem that I ever got published after I started writing poetry again. So uh, that, one's, that one's very dear to my heart for that reason. Anyone else? Well, thanks so much for coming and... <laughs> If, anyone, if anyone's interested in buying books, I have copies of both of my books. They're $15, and I'll be selling them and signing them outside. Thank you very much, Susan. I just wanted to thank you all for coming and to invite you to join us in two weeks on Monday, May 3rd, for a reading by South Dakota writer Mary Hogue, Daughters of the Grasslands through the looking glass of Korea. And so that'll be at the Marshall Lyon County Library at noon to one and then here at seven o'clock. Thank you all very much. <laughs>